Namaskaram, all of you. Namaskaram, Namaskaram. Guru. Namaskaram. Shall we begin? So, a warm welcome to each and every one of you, and thank you, Sadhguru, in advance for giving us this uh, session where you're going to be guiding us through uh, towards the rebuilding of the nation and new avenues for real estate in these challenging times. Very quickly, I just want to mention that I had the good fortune of visiting the ashram. And if there was one place, one other place I'd like to be right now, other than my own home, uh, Sadhguru, it would be the ashram. I still remember uh, very vividly uh, the walk around the entire ashram where your, uh, where your devotees had taken me to the Dhyana Linga and the meditation out there. I think I'm not a very, uh, I don't meditate a lot and I do not have any experience, but it was so easy to slip into the meditation in the environment that was, that was created out there. And then when I heard about the geometry and the, the design aspects of that place, I thought you'd be a far better builder than most of us that are, that are here on the panel right now. I also visited the Linga Bhairavi, and uh, I must tell you, there was such a strong energy around that, uh, around, you know, the, 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 around the Devi that was created out there, and that filled us up also. Uh, then I visited the Surya Kand, and it was phenomenal just taking a dip in over there and getting, uh, getting recharged in a way that was, that was beautiful. And again, the entire geometry of that place was so beautiful. Uh, but what, what Sadhguru really touched me was the Isha home school. It was not a school. It was a larger family. And I'm telling you, if, if my kids, if I could see my kids away from me, and if I could send them away, I think that school of holistic learning is where I would definitely send them. So all in all, I think it was a beautiful day that I had spent out there. And I do wish to come back in over there again. And I'd like everyone to get a glimpse of your ashram, your creation. And can we just play the video so that everyone can quickly take a look at what you've created, what magic you've created there. Secret space. At the Isha Yoga Center, ancient techniques have been revived to create a timeless space, one designed to stand for many millennia. The Dhyanalinga is the focal point of the Yoga Center, the Mulasthana of the Kshetra, the first of its kind to be completed in thousands of years. Dhyana means meditation and Linga means the form. A doorway to enlightenment, Dhyanalinga creates the possibility to experience life in its totality. The Dhyanalinga dome is built without cement, steel, concrete or pillars. Just 180,000 bricks and mud mortar, stabilized with additives. At the entrance of the Dhyanalinga, one encounters the Sarvadharma pillar, embodying the essence of spirituality beyond sectarianism. A few steps away sits Nandi, relaxed yet intense, the embodiment of meditativeness. A sacred journey begins with a purifying dip. The Surya Kund and Chandra Kund are energized water bodies. Unique in form, they are built with massive 50-ton granite blocks. To the southeast is Linga Bhairavi, an exuberant expression of the Divine Feminine. Within her abode, Devi is manifested as a linga, a unique form for the mother goddess. The architecture is just a play of geometry. Right now, all the buildings here, it is not standing because of the strength of its material. It is standing only because of the perfectness of the geometry. That's the beauty of what we're doing here. The entire ashram is itself a symphony of geometry and alignment. Spanda Hall is a 44,000 square foot program venue. The design reflects the essence of yoga as a technology for inner engineering. Outside in the garden is a massive rock. I just looked at one particular rock. I fell in love with the rock. I said, I want her. And these people carried this rock and brought it. 
120 tons over 150 kilometers. No cranes or big machines, just oil jacks, enthusiasm, and ingenuity. The center also houses the Isha Homeschool, a scene of conscious chaos in design and activity. It creates a vibrant ambience for learning. The Isha aesthetic manifests on the other side of the globe, too. Mahima, a 39,000 square foot meditation hall, is the first of its kind in the West. Adi Yogi Temple is a tribute to Adi Yogi, the first yogi and guru, a being whose contribution to raising human consciousness is unparalleled. Dominating the 30,000 square foot space is a 21 foot likeness of Adi Yogi. Designed, constructed and transported from India, it is only the first of many. The science of yoga brings the highest level of exuberance, an absolute stillness and an internal intoxication at the same time. So, we wanted to create a face which will exude these three qualities of stillness, exuberance and intoxication. I request the Prime Minister to present Adi Yogi, the source of yoga to the world. Hundred and twelve feet because Adi Yogi offered one hundred and twelve ways through which a human being can attain to one's highest possibility. As an acknowledgement and above all, as a tool to transmit these possibilities to the world, an iconic presence is needed to bring this science to humanity. This is a movement from narrow religious divide to a universal responsibility. There is no need for you to innovate anything. If you… if you just have enough observation and perception for all the fantastic design that is everywhere in every leaf, if you just simply imitate what's in nature, it'll be too phenomenal. People will think you're a genius but you're a copycat <laughs> That's all it takes. I was there with you in person doing this uh, webinar is, is obviously going to be very enlightening to everybody, but the spiritual feeling that one gets at your ashram would have been phenomenal, Sadhguru. And thank you for creating something so beautiful for everybody to come and learn from. So uh, Sadhguru, very quickly, I'll just introduce the subject uh, one more time and the esteemed panelists out here. Uh, we are Kredai. Uh, Pradai MCHI and Pradai, which is more than 20,000 members across the country, all real estate developers, and Naredko, with his 5,500 members, we between ourselves represent all developers in the real estate industry. So the crowd or the, the people that you have hearing you today are all those who are directly affected by the present situation and would all be very pleased, Sadhguru, to hear from you with regards to um, what you have to say. Would you like to say a few words before we start with the question answers from this stellar uh, gathering? Uh, namaskaram and good evening to all of you. <coughs> well, you're all big builders. Well, the construction industry or the building industry, uh, please uh, try to understand me in the right context <laughs> because uh, you know, it has acquired a certain amount of negativity around itself. In uh, many cities, uh, it's almost next to uh, kind of, uh, you know, 
because... Uh, because the nature of laws and the way our country operates uh, land transactions and these things, because it's acquired a certain amount of negativity. I think all of you who are responsible builders must change that image, because changing that image is very, very important for the future of uh, building this nation, because you are the guys who are building uh, the nation in many ways and uh, the kind of uh, structures you build is where we work, where we live in this country. So it's very important, the image is also cleared, because why I'm saying this is, generally in most people's minds, it's become like this. Building industry is right next to the underworld or something like that. Things have changed a lot in the last ten, fifteen years, but I'm saying it must further change because all of you responsible builders who are striving to, uh, right now in these hard times or challenging times, striving to see how you can be a part of building this nation, where there is a lot to be done. When there is so much to be done, it's very important, even if our hands are clean, it's important that our face also should be clean, because how people see us matters. And this is an area I think we have not paid enough attention to. And for this to happen, if the building industry has to become absolutely... absolutely clean, I think many laws which are ambiguous and which naturally leads to uh, dealing in a certain way has to change. Demanding those changes in the legal structure, demanding those changes in the policy structure is a very much a part of your responsibility. Uh, if that policy change doesn't happen, where land trans transaction can happen in a clean way, and uh, selling of uh, whatever properties happens in a clean way. If this doesn't happen, naturally, invariably, you will have to seek help from agencies which are beyond uh, law enforcement. So this is a thing that we have to settle because without settling this, this building industry exploding into a, a, a massive uh, possibility, which is what is needed right now. See. Uh, you're building a few million square feet of some things, one uh, different uh, construction companies building that is not the thing. We have to build this nation. When I say build this nation, nearly sixty, seventy percent of the population is still living in almost, uh, you know, slum-like shacks. So if we have to really build this nation where every citizen in this country lives in a decent enough, uh, what to say, res uh, accommodations, and everybody gets to work in a clean enough, good enough, healthy enough kind of uh, atmosphere from industry to ofi office spaces to residential spaces. If we have to build that, I'm telling you, you have to do hundred times more work than what you're doing right now. That's what should happen in a developing country. That's what needs to happen in a developing country. For this cleaning up of the image of the building industry is very important. I know right now there are some laws towards this, but to facilitate things like RERA and all that stuff, it's very important, land transactions and building permissions, all these things must be unambiguous. The policy has to change about it. If the policy doesn't change, then the corruption that inevitably you confront everywhere you go, building industry and uh, can never escape the departmental corruptions, you are very much part of it, you cannot escape that, they've made sure you do not escape that. So. It's important to demand in every state, uh, this uh, a body like Red Eye should spearhead this and see that wherever there are loopholes, wherever unnecessary bribery and things happen, because of that various other transactions happen, we must ensure the ambiguous nature of the law must be removed. It must be very clear what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. Just to give you an example, for example, here, uh, you know, uh, we are... as you know, our centers are here. To build anything, what circus we go through, I'm saying we are a spiritual organization, we know everybody in the government, but still it will take twelve to fourteen months to get a permission here. In United States, we are building a massive thing, our property is now a little over four thousand acres, it's going to be another nearly twelve thousand acres in the next few months, so it's a massive center. But we just have to acclimatize ourselves to the building codes and we just build. We simply build. But before we occupy, only one inspector comes in his SUV. He's got weapon, he's got handcuffs, 
He's got all the measuring instruments, laser measuring instruments, he comes, spends the day with you and checks everything is by the law. If it is there, right there he signs it and goes, otherwise he will take you handcuffed back to, uh, st you know, state's hospitality. So this is all it is, you just go by the code. Why in this country are we treating every… everybody like a criminal? Why do you believe I will break the law? This is something that we must work for. Building laws are there, all of us acquaint ourselves with that and build by that. Only on completion certificate, somebody can come and check whether we've gone by the law or not. If there is anything off, we must fix it or whatever. But right now, we must get uh, ten NOCs and then permissions and licenses. This will breed corruption. Because it breeds co corruption, all kinds of forces get into the building uh, industry. This has to go because if we want to make this developing country, unfortunately we've been developing a rather too long a period of time. We're going on developing, developing, when will we be a developed country? If we have to be a developed country, the building industry has a significant role in making this into a developed country. Right now, many of you have created small oases of development, but it's not spread across the country, not every citizen gets to enjoy it. For that, I know the economic atmosphere has to change, but one important aspect is the building rules must become unambiguous. It must be very, very clear, there should be no room for corruption. When there are no demands of corruption and delays, I think uh, industry can work itself out of its present image, because this image building is as important as the building itself, because without that, we will not create a, a country that, that we want to build. We will only create small oasis here and there. So it's important that India's infrastructure becomes of uh, world class. If this needs to happen, this is something that Kredai should spearhead, that the ambiguous nature of loss must go. It must be very clear. A builder must be trusted that he will go by the law. Why this thing that every citizen is being treated like a criminal and then you have to prove you are not one? So this uh, is something that I would beseech that all of you should strive for. Guru, uh, you have literally touched a raw nerve with us and you have actually hit the nail on the head at the same point of time. I can tell you it has been the endeavor of our Kredai uh, to continually interact with the government and only put this across and say, treat us as your partner. We are ready to cooperate with you. We wish to build this nation. Give us an opportunity that will allow us to prove our worth. And we are, Sadhguru, like you, are, you have said, we are probably the best in the world at this moment in time. It is only the fetters that, that keep us down. And I hope everything you've said goes to the highest offices in this country and they understand that we are like that lotus flower. Please stop looking at the muck around. Please look at what we have done and, and allow us to, you know, move ahead and create. So I'll start off again by saying thank you to you, Sadhguru, for, for touching upon that. Now, as a session, as, as uh, we, we move along, Sadhguru, uh, the questions are going to be more to do with the way the economy is going to pan out for real estate developers and what are the avenues available. I'll start with the first question, if you permit. Uh, Sadhguru, they say you build a home. First you build a home and then your home builds you. And we've been doing, I can say this, a phenomenal job across the country. All our members have been continually educating themselves on the latest uh, technologies available, designs available, and building beautifully in, in the cities and in, in tier two towns. But Sadhguru, the human race actually thrived because they all came together. We built our villages, we built our towns, we built our cities. Now, with the most stringent lockdown that one has seen, in a long, long time, I have never heard of 64 days of a lockdown for an entire nation, which has in a way crippled us. Where do you think is, is the future? What do you think is the best case you know, scenario out of this 64-day lockdown, and what is it we developers should prepare for? Over to you. Over to you. <clears throat> well, uh, 64 days is a <laughs> long time to close down a nation, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the scientific community in the world is still not able to come out with a clear, clear estimate of this is how this virus will behave, this is what we can do with it, this is how many months it will take to clear it up, 
there is no such estimate, every day it is changing. And uh, every day, initially it started as a respiratory infection, now they say it just about affects every part in your body. Initially they said it affects only one population, now it's all over the place. So this is leaving everybody in confusion. If that clarity was there, we could take economic call much better. Right now, there is no one clear statement from any scientific agency in the world that this is the nature of this virus, this is how we can fix it. Even if you cannot fix it right now, at least you know this is what you can do about it. We're talking about a vaccine, now they're saying there are ten mutations to the virus already. So, by the time you give 7.6 billion people or 1.4 billion people in this country, ten different vaccines, you know we took over twenty years to control polio, all right? So that's how long it takes. So if you keep such a level of openness as to when is the time when this is going to get fixed, naturally this lockdown became, uh, you know, from fifteen, uh, fifteen days to twenty... twenty-one days it went on, now it is sixty-four days. It is partially cleared now. Whether uh, virus clears up or not, we have to open up the economy and function because we cannot uh, suffocate ourselves like this forever. But with this, we have sa saved a lot of lives, we have contained it. But now with the opening of the economic activity, where it will go, we still do not know. But especially those of you who are in Mumbai, you know you can't just open up that city right now, it will go crazy. People will die. People will die means there is a vulnerable population, that means a whole lot of people are philosophizing, after all, old people will die. Well, who is old, who is young, who is to decide? Who is to decide who should die, who should live? It is not for us to take such decisions. Unfortunately, various kinds of debates and philosophies are being woven around the world. So, it's important that we approach this in a compassionate manner. So, life versus livelihood, as uh, everybody is debating, you cannot do life versus livelihood, both need to happen. Life cannot happen without livelihood. At the same time, livelihood is meaningless without life. So it is a... it is a very... nobody can take an absolutely perfect call. We have taken a call, we have contained it largely for the kind of population and the density of population we have. I think we have dealt with it very well till now. But uh, these few cities, Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Chennai, Delhi all going berserk, particularly Mumbai going out of control and the financial capital is crippled like that, for how long we can afford that, we do not know. So having said that, when can this industry, particularly building industry, can open up and function as normal? Well, if the virus ambiguity continues, if it gets over, let's say by August, September, let's say it's cleared up, we've forgotten the virus by September, then I would say in another six to nine months, uh, things will be back to reasonably normal. But if this virus ambiguity continues for nine to twelve months, it's a problem. That problem, we will not recover very quickly. Suppose it continues up to eighteen to twenty-four months, then it is much bigger problem because people will get into the habit of digging in, not spending the money, not making any new investments, not wanting to move to a bigger house, all these things will go away from people's minds. Just dig in and try to survive will become the mode if it lasts for more than a year, year and a half or two years. So, I only hope that the scientific community will be able to come out with some... some kind of, uh, uh, what to say, uh, confidence for the governments to take decisions and the businesses to take decisions and for people to feel more confident as to what exactly are they risking. Right now, most human beings, though there is so much information out there, there is no absolute clarity what is it that we are risking, who is risking their lives, who is risking their health. There is no such thing because all sorts of things are happening around the world. As you see, in a country like United States, it's just gone totally off, nearly hundred thousand people dead as of... as of today. So, industry, particularly building industry, where it is a... for a ordinary citizen, it is a substantial investment in his life. In India especially, most people buy only one home in their lifetime. When that is the case, definitely this industry will suffer quite a bit. But at the same time, there are... there are massive possibilities that industrial growth can burst forth 
in the next one and a half to two years' time, considering the geopolitical situations and what may come towards India, and India is pitching for that possibility right now, which is uh, definitely a good uh, possibility and we are standing number one in that line where certain industries want to come out of a particular nation and go elsewhere. So if that begins to happen, there will be a massive, a massive amount of construction. When I say construction, especially industrial construction, road construction and obviously residential constructions around that. So for this, I think the way we are approaching real estate industry has to rejig itself in our mindset because then this will all be concentrated construction in areas where these uh, special industrial zones are coming up. There are big plans for this because nearly 300 companies from China want to move out completely or partially and a whole lot of them can come to India. And right now there's an effort to move this to all the 28 states so that uh, development happens in an even way across the country. If such a possibility opens up in a big way, what they're looking at is somewhere between one to 1.5 trillion dollars of investment should come into India in the next two years' time. If that happens, there will be a phenomenal amount of, uh, you know, building industry to happen, but not necessarily the way it is happening right now, that you get a prime site in the city and build your, uh, you know, uh, apartment blocks and stuff. From there, you have to shift to… Uh, from being just a building in builder, you must become a nation builder. <laughs> Sadhguru, you didn't give us uh, the worst and the best case scenario. I mean, I just leave it with a thought before I move to Jakshay that… Uh... Everybody starts making predictions. This will not be a judicious prediction, this will be astrological. So let's not go that way. It's important, this is the reality in which we exist. If all of us strive, we can make this happen, otherwise no. I understand that, Sadhguru, and uh, like I said, you've given the worst and the best case situation, but just leaving it with a thought before I go on to Jakshay that the government has done extremely well to take care of the physical health of the people, but the mental health due to the financial constraints and the social health of the people might be something that a lot more needs to be done for. Having said that, I'll move to Jakshay. Jakshay is the chairman, Pradai. Um, Jakshay, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, first of all, not Mustang Pranam. Uh, I know a uh, lot of uh, responsibility from Kedai, Kedai MCH and Narirko, my friends, and a lot of humbleness, I can say that we are not uh, beneficiary of the system, but the victim of the system. Anyway, but I can, this, I know that this is a toughest time to be a leader or to be a decision maker. But we at Kedai, more than 20,000 members, 207 city chapters, a state of a uh, lot of anxiety and restlessness. So my question would be, we as leaders do spread maximum positivity to our industry, brothers and staff members. But at last there is a vast difference between the optimism versus reality. Because of what's coming as an industry assistance from the government in terms of big ticket economic uh, support, which is very necessary for our survival or our members' businesses. Guruji, how do we as Kredai leaders enthuse or guide our members who believe that the end is very close and may just give, give up their fight for survival? What would your guiding thoughts and words to keep them in a healthy mental balance? And because I know you and I'm at the golf course now, I can take that liberty, Bhaman, if you have permi permission. Uh, I, so what I'm saying, you're on a golf course and talking about difficult times, huh? <laughs> you, <laughs> you're having a bad game. <laughs> so, uh, Guruji, uh, the staying active and uh, fit are integral to living healthy lives uh, and beating pessimism. As we know, you have some passion for golf and sports and a thing also. What do you suggest we practice to further our seminar and dedication? Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, as, uh, as you said, uh, 
the administration uh, can only function within the limitations of its own resources. There's nothing more or less that we can do. But uh, having said that, the problems of real estate uh, will not be about loan restructuring or banks and things because those things can be negotiated. I'm sure there's going to be a whole new world of negotiations. But the problem is of demand <coughs> that it… because your demand doesn't depend on how much you can build, your demand depends on how the rest of the industry and the economy functions, that people should have money to invest in a home or in a new office space or whatever that is. So, creating demand is something that uh, the government is looking at in a very serious manner. And as I said, we are looking… because without… right now, without a massive foreign investment coming into the country, it's going to be difficult for us to come out of this quickly. It will take a long time to come out of it if we don't get a huge amount of foreign investment. Right now in India, foreign investment just comes to Mumbai, plays in the stock market when it's convenient, otherwise it goes away. No foreign investment must come into construction, must come into bridges, roads, uh, ports and whatever else, you know, or even residential properties and commercial properties, it needs to come in. These bold steps have to be taken. I think already a few steps have been taken uh, because in trying to be bold, we don't want to lose our judiciousness. So that is always there. So about yourself, keeping your stamina, you're well, uh, don't use those carts in the golf course, just walk it, huh? Eighteen holes, if you walk it, you will get physical stamina. Mental well-being <laughs> Mental well-being, I think every one of you should take this up, this is a good time. Uh, that is, uh, simple processes, we are offering various things uh, available to you, uh, various simple practices like Isha Kriya, Simha Kriya, which enhances your uh, immune system. These are all available uh, as free downloadable processes. Otherwise, I would, uh, you know, I can send the link to all of you if you wish. There is Inner Engineering Online being offered. This is a simple way for people… See, this is all. There are various aspects to this. One thing is our body, how our body should function, how our mind should function, how our emotions should function, how our basic life energy should function. If these four things are happening well within us, then our ability to create the outside situation is greatly enhanced. If our body doesn't take instructions from us, mind doesn't take instructions from us, our emotions are sloshing all over the place, our energies don't behave the way we want, then our ability to create what we want will become greatly crippled. When we face challenging situations, what it means is, we are facing a situation which is not a simple situation that we have to struggle to deal with it, or in other words, the outside world in some way has become challenging. When outside is a challenge, you should not become a challenge by yourself. For most human beings, their own thought and emotion is a big challenge. They don't need any enemy from outside. They don't need a virus actually. They can sit at home, they can walk on the golf course and freak. I see so many people doing that. They're playing a game but they're losing their mind doing that. Simply because the way you think and feel is not controlled by you. So this inner engineering process, the whole process involves all the four dimensions of body, mind, emotion and energy, but the online process handles just thought and emotion. If you can think and feel the way you want, being blissful and joyful is a natural consequence. So how can I be blissful in a crisis? Especially in a crisis, you must be blissful because in a crisis means your body, your brains must function at its best, not be paralyzed. If you are in anxiety, if you are in fear, if you are in those kind of things, you get paralyzed. So there is substantial scientific and medical evidence to show that only when you are in a state of some kind of pleasantness within you, your body and your mind functions at its best. In many ways, how well you harness your body and your brains is your success in the world, in many ways. Not the whole of it, at least to a large part, that's what it is. So it's important that everybody does a little bit of inner engineering within themselves, bring themselves to a state, when there is a challenging situation, your faculties don't fail you. When there is a challenging situation, you yourself do not aga turn against yourself. Whatever this anxiety, stress, fear, terror, whatever it is, 
you can give it any number of names, but essentially it is about your intelligence turning against yourself. Once your intelligence turns against yourself, there is no force in the universe that can do any good for you. So this is important that your intelligence always works for you, never against you. So you may say, no, I'm stressed because of my business. You are not stressed because of your business, you are stressed because you do not know how to handle your thought and emotion. This is what inner engineering means. You learn this fundamental thing, that your thought and your emotion is never an impediment in your life. There are substantial challenges outside, let's deal with them. Sadhguru, we will definitely make sure to tell all Gridai members they, they need to need build themselves up because the strongest force that comes from within is the only one that's going to help us at this moment in time. Uh, may I request all panelists to please speak up a bit? There is some kind of a feedback that we need to speak up louder. Uh, next, I'll ask uh, Dr. Niranjan Hiranani to ask his question. He is the national chairman, uh, national president, Mareko. Namaskaram, Guruji. It's such a pleasure and privilege to be here today. You know I'm a great admirer of yours. And one of the things which I admire the most is your concept of rejuvenation of rivers and the plantations of trees to give life to this country, not only to agrarian, but actually to bring back India into the forefront in terms of rejuvenation of life by itself. Okay. Guruji, uh, we as builders, have a great vision about our cities, uh -huh. as all people would love to do as nation builders. And you have given us this kind nomenclature of saying that we should be nation builders. But what have we done? Our great cities have actually turned into slums. 50% of our people living in a city, which is the richest city in India, has got 50% of them live in Jhopadpatis. Our infrastructure is collapsing. Roads, transport are just not there. Can you, Guruji, give us some idea of what you think should be our vision and the roadmap? Because we may dream a lot of things, but what's the first steps that we really need to do in order to make this change, wherein our great cities, which we always had, would actually turn back and really become great cities again? Maybe the same idea as rejuvenating of rivers and bringing about some concept. Maybe you could guide us and tell us what this kind of vision should also be there so that before the end of my life, I take the first step in that direction. Uh, the first step. <laughs> What's the full name? I'm sorry, Hirnandani. Niranjan. 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 Uh, Niranjan, the first step that needs to happen is... Let me give a little context before I say this. See, today uh, it's estimated that about seventy-six to seventy-eight percent of the world's investment is in actually thirty-two cities in the world. That means investment is so focused in some places, naturally people tend to move in that direction. Before the virus, the estimate was in the coming decade, that is by twenty-thirty in the world, 1.6 billion people will migrate. In India, 220 million people will migrate in the next ten years. Tell me which city is capable of mopping up that kind of population. As you're saying already, in Mumbai, 42 to 44 percent of the population is living in slums. But it's not just Mumbai, I want you to understand the whole country is a slum. If you come to the villages, you will see the whole nation is living as a slum. This is simply because it is unplanned and it simply happened over a period of time. We are an ancient nation, simply it's grown like that. So, at some point we must have the courage to replan and redesign the country, not just go on living the same way. So, as a part of this, I have given these plans to some of the builders. Well, in the international forums, I have presented this, hugely appreciated everywhere, but nobody has done it yet. So, Niranjan Bhai, if you are willing to do it, let me talk about it <laughs> I'm promoting a concept called one building city, just one building, a city. For example, I'm just throwing the numbers off the cuff, we, you can reimagine the numbers uh, based on various other realities. Let's say we take fifty-acre plot, 
It need not be within the city, you can put it out fifty kilometers away from the city, even up to hundred kilometers, anywhere between fifty to hundred kilometers you can go. Fifty acre plot, land-wise it will come cheap compared to what you pay in cities. Now in these fifty acres, you build only one acre, two FSI is anywhere there, so you build, uh, you know, nearly hundred floors you can build if you want, forty-nine acres of land. You just make it into trees, ponds, walking spaces, beautiful atmosphere like a forest for people to live there. In these… in these hundred floors, you can make residential accommodations, offices, shopping, school up to seven standard, eight standard, after that they can go out. Generally, people who live there, just live there, work there, everything there, they shop there, whatever. Once a week, if they wish to drive their automobile out, they can go. No waste no input, everything generated there and everything done there. No question of sewage going out, nothing. Everything can be managed right there. Above all, people will get to live in a verdant atmosphere, forest. Right now, look at the way our children are growing up. How do you expect them to grow up as sensible human beings? If they step out of their homes, they are walking straight into the traffic. There is no place to play, there is no place to kick a ball, there is no place to run around. There's nothing, they're just cooped up in their apartments, watching televisions or, you know, people are saying, why are they all watching on the, the screen? Tell me, where is space for a child to go and run carefree? If he runs carefree, he will get killed within two days. It's happening all the time. So, we need to build cities like this. This is very much possible, particularly if you can sell it to the idea to, let us say, an IT st companies are the easiest to go for. An IT company can build residentials, uh, working spaces, shopping, schooling, everything right there and forty-nine acres of just forest, never to be tampered because anyway you complete the two FSI, it's a done thing. If we… whether it can be fifty acres or twenty-five acres, but the same proportion if you go for. And the villages, right now a local village here, we're close to us, with a population about six thousand people. It occupies anywhere between tw fifteen to twenty acres or twenty-two acres, somewhere in that range. This village, the conditions in which they are living, human beings, animals, everybody living together, we can build a city like this for them, a village which is tall, only thing is they must come together. How to bring them together, can you bring all these people together? If we set up one or two examples and people see that they can live way better this way, they can be cattle shed separately, animals, people can live in apartments, about ownership and other things, we can sort out all those issues. If this is done, this is the only future for us because for 1.4 billion people, we don't have enough land to build independent houses all over the place. That is only for a small percentage of people. Rest of them will anyway have to live in tall buildings, but now there are thousand rules about everything and it doesn't go to escape these rules, people are building shorter buildings all over the place. So this has to change and if we make one city, one building is one city by itself. In a building about five to ten thousand people live, that's a city by itself. This city doesn't drive out every day, except a few people who have to go out. Most people work there, live there, go to school there, everything is settled there. Once in a way, just for their… you know, whatever their own pleasure and joy, they want to drive somewhere, they can always drive. If we don't do this, right now everybody wants to own a car. Every car manufacturer would… dream is to sell at least one car to every family. If every family in the country has one car, where will you build the roads? You will have to do flying cars, all right? There is not even enough airspace, I'm telling you. Our population is such. Once we have such a population, we have to think differently. It's very, very important. Right now, we're busy, busy building airports and airports. I am not against it, but in India, right now, two hours ahead, you have to go to the airport and do all the uh, things. I decided I will rather ride a, my motorcycle to Mumbai than uh, go to the airport, wait there for two hours, go through all those tests, wear a mask and sit like you're going into space or something. I'm not going to do that. I'm saying, if you… if every highway that you're building, in the center, if you put a rail line and people are asking, do we need bullet train, we, do we need that? We need something faster than a bullet, if you ask me. Because for 1.4 billion people, you are not going to fly them. You are trying to imitate the American model, it's just silly. You cannot fly 1.4 billion people. 
the best way to transport them is always rail, because rail is a mass transport. If the faster you make it, for, suppose Coimbatore to Bangalore, if you build a rail line, which is just uh, 350 kilometers, if you can do it in one hour, the development will happen all along. Even if you stop in five different places and take one and a half hours, people will work here, there and along the way, the whole thing will develop. Unless we spread this, unless we spread the investment and in turn the development, there is no way. Right now, these proposals, we've given it to the government also, talking about how industry should spread all over the place. This concentration has done, created this migrant population and you have seen the disaster how they are going through their lives and over five crore uh, uh, labor is working for your industry. And uh, I think a whole lot of migrant labor walking back are also these. Why have they left their villages, their homestead and come here? Simply because there's no livelihood there. We need to create it right there as much as possible. A small number coming is okay. Such a massive population moving means there is such degradation of life, especially for women and children of those families. It's terrible what they go through. Once they come to the city, they may have little more money, but the quality of their life and the basic dignity of their existence, which they had in the village even if they are very poor, is completely taken away once they come to the slum, dehumanization of a human being happens and that is not the way we should build this nation. It's all of you should plan, I'm just giving you a simple idea, but we must look at this, how we must live more vertical spaces and more, pl you know, pl more forested areas around us. Everybody should have access to some kind of nature. See, every, every child should hear bird calls and see animals running, doing this, doing that, all this must happen. Otherwise, we will not grow a healthy nation. It's very, very important to do this now. Thank you for that. Um, actually, my DG Kredai... My has... next project will be like that. Uh, uh, thank you, Nirmal Bhai. So, Sadhguru, just very quickly, I'd like to... Uh, before I, I bring Irfan Bhai to ask you the next question, I'd like to just say my DG Kredai has actually reached out to me to put in a request to you. With your tremendous knowledge and with, with your grip on facts, you knew that five crore people are working for the real estate industry in terms of the migrant laborers. He has, he has put in a request to me and I'll, I'll, I'll just put it across to you. He says, we need a voice like yours, which reaches at the very top to be able to get clarity of policy that will allow us to create these visionary uh, developments. And towards that, Sadhguru, any time and any uh, effort that you put in will be appreciated by all my fraternity. And towards that, with, with folded hands, I, I, I request you. Uh, if Beyond I this want... conference... Uh... Beyond this conference, let's have a conversation and see what we can do. Thank you. I would like to call on Irfan Bhai, who's our uh, ex-chairman, Kredai, to ask the next question. Namaskaram, Guruji. What, you opened up the golf course, huh? The last day yes, yes. before you closed, I played at your place and then left. <laughs> mm -hmm. no, it, 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 it was a pleasure playing with you too. And uh, the golf course is open now, Guruji. Actually, it's a real pleasure for me to be on your panel and listen to your words of wisdom. You have this very simple, effervescent style of explaining very complex situations in your very own calm and composed manner. Guruji, just now, people have developed a fear psychosis. There's a fear of the unknown. And this is leading to huge anxiety and different reactions. In this background, businesses also have to make difficult choices and even take the extreme step of letting go of people who have been with them for a very long time. And we are always in this conundrum of between the seva bhav and the dharma. How do we resolve this dilemma in our heads? How do you think we should react and how do you think that we should also take decisions? Well, uh, in challenging times, many times we are forced to make hard decisions. Hard decisions means, uh, you know, when uh, initially when it took off in Italy and Spain, the doctors had to make a decision, who should get the ventilator, who should not get the ventilator. 
Some nations, some hospitals decided on the basis of the age. What this means is, me and my mother went to the hospital. So we decide my mother should die, I should live. How do I live with that? Or if me and my daughter went to the hospital, they will decide I should die, my daughter should live. Younger people, younger person should live, older person should die. How do you make such decisions? But unfortunately, in challenging times, we are forced to make such decisions. Not able to take these decisions, in some of the hospitals, they did it by flip of the coin, they took lots. They took lots who should live, who should die. So, during challenging times, we are forced to take hard decisions. When we are required to take hard decisions, it's important we put our humanity at the highest place and take those decisions, but hard decisions are inevitable, we have to take. Uh, I'm trying to give you a simplistic answer, I know it's not that simple because we as an institution also facing this in a big way. One simple thing is because I… there was a textile uh, unit which uh, at one time employed over twenty thousand people and uh, they were in that kind of, you know, they had to roll… roll down or roll back. So at that time I gave them some ideas and it worked brilliantly well for them because they made it work. An idea is there but still to make it work is… execution is another aspect, they did it extremely well. One simple thing is to get all the employees together and make them take this decision. That is, see right now, Let's say… Uh, I'm just shooting the numbers off the cuff, okay? Let's say we are hundred people working here. We need to fire fifty people because the business can only afford that. Uh, another way is we call these hundred people, tell them, see, fifty people will lose their livelihood. Or all of us compromise our lifestyle and we will cut down the salaries by thirty percent or forty percent or six, fifty percent, whatever it takes. And we will also help to negotiate rentals and other loans and whatever they may have, we help them. We put a few people to help them to renegotiate those things or postpone those things, whatever, to ease some financial things. These fifty people, what do you do? Because your business has become half the size, what do I do with these fifty people extra? Fifty people dedicated and wanting to build the business back is an immense asset, never underestimate that. If you use these fifty people with some ingenuity, because now they know it is their survival and they want the company to succeed, they might not have seen it like that till now. They may just think it's a job. But today when they understand they're part of the company and they have to make this company successful, otherwise their own livelihood and the sacrifice that another fifty people have made to take half salaries for their sake, all this will weigh heavy on them and we should explore other possibilities, how these fifty people can be used. There will be many opportunities anywhere. As I said, this is a developing country, there are so many things, you're in construction industry, but you could do some… something else on the side. There are fifty people extra committed to working hard and making something happen, definitely we could use in so many ways. As the business improves, we can absorb them, or that itself, the new activity can become a business by itself. Just to, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> not uh, trying to be over smart with you because you are the builder, all right? I don't want to give you advice on that. But I'm saying there are so many allied things which are not being done properly, which always you depend on suppliers. And I know in construction industry in India, what kind of suppliers, how many times you have to run after them. It's not like you give an order and something comes to you. You must give an order and you must go and see if he's actually doing it, then you have to go and see whether he's transporting it to you or not, hundred different things. I know how it is. So, having said that, these allied industries you should… you can… you could explore as to how this extra labor that you have can be used there or whatever. I'm just saying this is just one possibility. Maybe you can't re retain all the fifty, maybe you can retain twenty-five. Maybe you can resign ten, we don't know how many, but this is an effort we can do. This will bring a new sense of commitment for the well-being of the industry or the business itself among the employees. They understand clearly, it's only our contribution which makes this company successful. The success of the company is the basis of my well-being. 
this must be understood by em every, every employee. They all become in some way partners to you and you can also promise them with this uh, sacrifice of fifty percent salary when you work, when we succeed, when we reach this much of turnover, we will give you something out of that. You know, these things have to be done. These are challenging times. All of us have to think differently how we are going to do the work that we have been, de been doing till now. It is business as usual is not going to happen. Sit back and, you know, I will just announce a project and it will sell. That itself has already changed and it's going to change in a dramatic way. This does not mean it's bad times, it is just challenging times. Are we up for the challenge or not is the only question. Thank you, uh, Guruji. I would say yat bhavana tat bhavati. The way you think is what you get. And we are very nicely, very simply put by you and I think all of us should follow your advice and uh, the, everybody will be happy. Thank you for that, uh, Sadhguru. Um, I would like Mr. Rajiv Talwar to put the next question to you. Is <laughs> Talwar by name. Uh, uh, Namaskar, Sadhguruji. Namaskar. I've had the pleasure of meeting you at the DLF golf course once when you were having breakfast. Tough course, all right. It, it, it's a tough life, yes. And for 74 years, DLF has existed. I hope you like the city that we've built and helped everyone. With everyone's help, we have reached where we are in Gurgaon and other cities of India. My question to you is, in your view, you're a very wise man. You have great intellect, precise wisdom and great foresight. But I'm also happy to learn that you've presented plans to the government, which have still to see the light of day and they've, you're sharing ideas with them. We have the same fortune. We also keep on going back to the government. I think what you've hit upon is very correct, that there should be some digital clearance so that everyone does not have to run around for getting clearances, plan sanction, time again, time after time. My question to you is what you seem to be speaking from your heart, that what is going to be the relationship between environment and urbanization in the pandemic post or in the pandemic world? What do we foresee according to you? Thank you. Thanks. See, one thing that's happened uh, in the country and probably almost everywhere, particularly in this country is, Building industry and ecology are supposed to be against each other. This is something that we must change because that is not the future, uh, how it's going to function. Future is very important that building and ecology must be friendly to each other. When I say friendly to each other, right now, as you know, almost all the cities are going through either floods or through droughts, you know. They have water shortages and they have floods all the time. One season you need a boat, Another season, you <laughs> you need an oil rig, not a regular bore well, because water is going below fifteen hundred feet. <laughs> so this is the constant uh, dilemma that's happening. One important thing I would uh, request and beseech all the builders is, wherever you make uh, you know concrete pathways and concretized uh, walkways and things, they must have sufficient per percolation holes. It is not necessary everybody should walk on a smooth surface. You can always make it in such a way that it absorbs water because this is one of the key thing. The reason why cities have become very destructive is simply because the rainwater, because that's the only source of water we have in this country. If it was, uh, let us say, we had snowfall or whatever, snow would sit for two months and slowly percolate into the earth. We don't have such a thing. We just have monsoon rains. When rains come, if it flows horizontally, we have lost it. It has to percolate. For this, we need plantations. And above all, concrete surfaces except the living areas has to have holes in it, has to have sufficient percolation spaces. All the parking lots, walkways, roads inside the development, all of them must have sufficient 
you know, uh, opportunity for the water to sink in. If that is not there, developments, large developments will naturally be perceived as uh, anti-ecological, uh, you know, well-being. So, having said this, as we already mentioned, we have 1.4 billion people. The land on which these 1.4 billion people is definitely not sufficient to have enough forests, enough rivers, enough lakes and all this. Compared to, let's say, North America, if you're taking North America as a standard, we are nowhere near that kind of land space. This is super congested in many ways. One important thing is to spread them out and if this, as we mentioned earlier, if daily travel and commuting on the road is brought down. You know, I was... Uh, a couple of years ago, I was near San Francisco, then I had an event in San Francisco club, the top uh, business in San Francisco area. Uh, about 250 business leaders were there and I was to speak to them and I was driving. Then I'm seeing the... Uh, the side in which I'm driving also the traffic is thick and the opposite side also the traffic is thick. So when I went there, all these uh, business leaders, I asked them, what is our problem? People who live here work there, people who live there work here, what is our problem? I live here, why don't I work here? And somebody lives there, why don't they work there? No, he lives there and works here, I live here and work there. This is our problem. Because unplanned development of cities have happened, it is time to restructure this, because the number of people on the road the amount of life that is lost in terms of time, the amount of energy that is wasted, amount of fuel wasted, and above all the nuisance. Those of you who live in Bangalore, uh, Irfan Bhai knows this very well. <laughs> He's right now sitting on the golf course near Nandi Hill, he is very happy now. But if he gets into the city, it doesn't matter what you're driving, it's a misery. Because simply too many people are on the road unnecessarily. When I say unnecessarily, why is everybody traveling in every direction? Because the fundamental thing is, it's planned like this, those who work here live there, those who live there work somewhere else. So this has to change. In a planned way, we have to change. It's not easy that it's not going to happen overnight, but if we start thinking in this direction, then ecological concerns can be addressed. And above all, vertical growth of the cities is most essential. Most people you know, our uh, ec ec ecology activists are there, they will complain about everything because they don't understand a thing. But if you have... if you have substantially tall buildings, you can create a whole lot of open spaces, lots of trees, this is most important. As you know, the... sir, you're in Delhi, so you know, this is the only city where we can see the air we breathe. I... I hear that now you cannot see it, you're able to see Himalayas or something, that's fantastic. <laughs> so I'm saying too many people who... Uh, who are not some race drivers or something, they're not people who are enjoying their drive, they just desperately want to get to their workplace. They're all driving their own personal vehicles, which is risk of life, inefficient way of driving and putting them to lot of stress and anxiety of trying to get there on time. And you see how it is, anybody who... you... you can hardly see a car which is not dented these days in our cities. It has some dent, that means everybody is bumping each other and screaming at each other, cursing each other. It's a wrong culture we're building all together. It's very, very important that city should be a pleasant place to live. I remember Bangalore city forty years ago and how it was, what a nice uh, pleasant thing it was. We used to ride from Mysore on motorcycles, come to Bangalore, Mahatma Gandhi Road was a racetrack for us <laughs> <laughs> but today, how it's become. So, further as economy improves, people want to live better. That means, live better means most people want to own a home where you will provide and most people want to have a car. And the roads are simply impossible for the population that we have. If everybody drives one car, it's simply impossible. You cannot even provide a parking space for all the cars. So, it's important that most people who don't really... who just want to go to some place, they're not trying to enjoy their drive. Such people should have mass transport to get there, very efficient mass transport, easy to get there without risking their lives. The number of people who are dying on the street, every year about 
140,000 people are dying on the Indian roads. These sixty days, their lives have been saved, that is one good thing that's happened. And every twelve minutes, a limb is lost in the country. Every four minutes, there is a fracture in the country. The WHO at one time said, you… Uh, India is trying to become a, a major uh, economy, but by some twenty-thirty, they estimated some seventeen or eighteen percent of Indian people will be crippled just by road accidents. So how are you going to build this economy with so many crippled people is a question that they raised at that time. So a lot of people here in Coimbatore and Chennai, they're trying to raise this awareness and try to make roads safe. But how to make it safe when there is no alternate means of transport or when there is a compulsion, everybody has to drive to get to his work, how do you make it safe? It doesn't work like that. So ecologically concerned city, one important thing is we must take care of the soil and the water. If we do not take care of the soil, we cannot take care of the water, let's understand this. So if those two things must be taken care of, right now the streets are flooding. Why are city roads always smooth? They need not be. They can be like how you make concrete lattice. It can be like that, it'll make some rumbling noise, but it's okay, but the water will get soaked into the earth, which is most important for a city. Otherwise, your trees will not grow, nothing will be there, and soil will not be rich. Taking care of the soil and water are not two different things. If you take care of the soil, water is naturally taken care of. If that happens, then vertical buildings and more uh, foliage all over the place will make our cities livable. Right now, except those who can afford large homes, for most other people, Indian city is actually quite unlivable. That's where we are going. I want to move Thank into you, Irfan's you. property. Uh, <laughs> there is a golf and there is a hill next to his property, so <laughs> You know, when you mentioned your ride, I saw to Bangalore, I was hoping you'd say it was on the SD Road Kings at that point of time, and I've done that ride many a time. And it was lovely seeing you on a Java. For those of you that don't know, Sadhguru is a great rider. And I hope to someday ride with you, Sadhguru, on a Java. Why not? <laughs> Can I call on Mr. Srikant Joshi to ask the next question, please? Thank you, uh, Boman, and uh, Namaskar, Sadhguru. Uh, we are really happy with your clear directions and the thought process so far. We at LNT are really happy and proud to do most of the infrastructure for the country, and to that extent, whatever we help in building the nation. All the employees are really happy to do that. My question to you is on the current dilemma for the next four or five years. We have seen uh, what has happened to the migrant laborers and how they were all forced to go back. While at LNT, we took care of about 3,000 labor, but as soon as the trains are starting, more than half of them want to go back, and which is understandable. But the reason they came firstly to the cities is because there were no livelihood in that uh, village for them. Living on Manrega and the government doles for years is also not a very graceful solution. At the same time, in the cities, there's a need and the construction technologies will take two, three years by the time you find a way to do with less labor. So what are the directions for the next three to five years till this structural difference happens? How to live with both in a very, uh, should I say, harmonious manner? Your direction would be happily appreciated. Well, the labor is not gone for good. As you said, only because there's no livelihood, they've come to the city. As you know that these days they're coming with their families, many of them, but most of them are male and their women folk and their children are elsewhere, so they have to go back. Right now, they went back not only because of their comfort or discomfort or insecurity in the city, they are very concerned what's back… happening back home. And also monsoons are coming and in case they want to do… start some agricultural activity for the next few months, they have to be there on time to lease lands, get into activity and all this stuff. So all these… there are many factors. But uh, inevitably they will come back. In my estimation, I could be wrong, but I am thinking, those who have gone back are not going to come back immediately, probably they will wait for Diwali to be over. 
That may sound a little ominous for the construction industry, but this is my guess that they will not come back till Diwali. That is, if this virus fear goes away by September, they will come back somewhere later part of October. But if this continues to the end of the year, like in United States they are predicting there is going to be a winter second wave, even when the Spanish flu happened, the real death toll happened only in its second wave. We cannot compare the Spanish influenza to this uh, COVID virus right now, they're two different things. But that's the only uh, standard we have to compare, so we keep comparing, but they're not actually comparable, they're very different kind, they killed a completely different age group. That virus largely killed uh, between twenty to forty years, this is killing largely over seventy years of age, so it's a different affair. But because we don't have any other standard to measure, we keep going back to Spanish flu. But the second wave was much bigger than the first wave with the Spanish flu. That also started in the month of January, but August, September became the worst part. So we have to just wait and see. Now we are opening up the economic activity. I think yesterday, twenty-four hours, it's been the biggest surge in India in terms of number of infections. These numbers are not really a gauge because it could be just the amount of testing we are doing, that it's increasing the numbers. Uh, so there is... See, at times like this, statistics and numbers should be used like a <laughs> how a, a drunken man will use a lamppost, only for support, not for illumination. This doesn't give us any clear picture, but it is just the only thing we can lean on and make guesses. So this is still a guess, but my guess is they won't come back large part of them will not come back till Diwali. So I think it's best the construction industry plans accordingly. We, instead of sitting here and waiting for the labor to come, I think you should send people out there, build confidence and uh, provide accommodations here and say, this time when you come, we will make sure we will take care of your medicine, food, this, that, whatever works, and you come back and work for us and whatever, you know, you have to do within the industry, you have to do as either as individual businesses or as a whole industry, whichever way you do it, I think that approach is very needed, that every time there is some kind of an emergency, people should not leave their work and run away somewhere else. That confidence you must build, you must use these few months to build that confidence with them, communicate with them and see how to bring them. Generally, as far as I know, as far as I know, you should know better, all of you, uh, because you're dealing with them directly. In... in my understanding, I think most labor in the cities are being brought by uh, maybe a few dozen agents who are coming. These agencies are... are uh, completely out of control agencies, they're exploiting them heavily, there are so many issues there. I think it's time you set up a body to bring so many labor. Let's say you're in Mumbai or Bangalore or wherever, how many construction labor do you need? All of you get together, create a kind of a... you know, a, a body which brings in... Let's say we want one lakh labor to come in. How to bring them in? Where, what is their mode of transport? Where will they be? What will happen? All these things, if they're looked at, you will have much control and better service. Of course, between businesses there is competition. How to do this is something you must figure out. But for long-term well-being of the industry, I think we must ensure there is a continuous flow of labor. Right now, if you are thinking of diversifying into more mechanized ways of doing things, as you said, it'll take uh, two to three years to do that. But this is a good time to do because a whole lot of construction industry is getting various inputs from China. How to uh, manufacture as much as possible here, I know there is price, there is issues and everything, but this is the time when there is a geopolitical shift. If we want to take advantage of that, this is the time we should do it. I was talking to a, a very major, you know, who's, a, who's become a dear friend, he's, he's the biggest uh, builder in Russia. He's built... forty percent of the housing in Russia is built by this one company. And uh, the three... three companies that he runs are the top three companies which are in competition with each other, but all three companies are owned by one person. That's how he runs his business and because in Russia, beyond a certain point, if it goes, it comes to government's focus, they're doing something like that. It's a very large industry. So when he wanted to come to India and I asked him, what can you do? Like, what is it that you can do that Indian companies cannot do? He said, 
I can build fifty million square feet of residential buildings in sixty days. I thought that was too kind of uh, exaggerated word. He said, Sadhguru, you don't hesitate, you get me an opportunity, clear things for me in, the, in your government, I can build fifty million square feet in sixty days, I have full-scale industries, I can transport anywhere and build what you want. So, if they have that kind of scale and capability, I don't know, you must be better judge of that... Uh, uh, that number, but if not that number, whatever number, I think we need to move in that direction, but at the same time we have the responsibility of providing employment for all these poor people who have no other livelihood. So creating some kind of a body to get them with least amount of exploitation from these agents and others is one aspect that you could look at it. It's not that it's going to fix all the problems, but uh, we could start moving in that direction. And uh, labor in India must be used. If you don't use them, mechanize everything, then what is the point? How? Because after all, people have to live, we have to take care of that. A large company like l and I'm sure you have your own plans to do that. And uh, many, many products which are coming from China, we should start looking how to do this because the world is moving in that direction. Integration and, and taking care of the labor, I think that was a very good idea to propagate that they will be safe. Sadhguru, before I ask Vikas Oberoi to speak, may I seek your permission? We may go a little beyond time. Thank you. Uh, Vicky, would you like to ask the next question? Namaskaram, Guruji. Namaskaram. Uh, firstly, thank you for uh, taking this webinar and uh, enlightening us with your knowledge. You did touch upon uh, the fact that India has been a developing nation for a very long time. Guruji, we all know and we all agree that India is a rich country, blessed with natural resources and fertile land. We also have the largest number of doctors, engineers and scientists in the world. We have space age technology and have been to Mars and back. Yet, it pains me to see that we are unable to provide basic drinking water, uh, sanitation, housing, education, and healthcare to people. You know, why do you think we have failed as a society? And what can we do to really change this, Guruji? Your guidance, please. Well, <clears throat> you're drawing me into political issues. <laughs> Well, we must understand this, when the British left this nation in 1947, we were not really a nation. We were in a terrible economic condition and uh, illiteracy was uh, ninety-three percent, I think, at least ninety percent. And our average life expectancy of an Indian was twenty-eight years. Today it is seventy-three or seventy-four years. That's a phenomenal achievement for any nation. And above all, our population was three and... Uh, I mean, thirty-three crores. Today, it's uh, inching towards hundred and thirty crores. So, in seventy-two years, we've multiplied our population four times, not necessarily by excessive reproduction, it's simply because life expectancy has gone up, which is a very wonderful achievement for a nation. So, when we postpone death, we should have also postponed birth, which we were little slow on doing. But right now, we are who we are, we have the population that we have. And uh, because of this life expectancy improving, we have a demographic d advantage of having a young population. But a young population is a lot of nuisance if they're unfocused, unskilled, uncommitted to anything. Uh, they're a big nuisance. But if you have a young population which is inspired, focused and competent, then we can be a miracle. So essentially, we have not... Uh, we did not understand or we did not focus on understanding that nation is people. Nation is not dams, nation is not bridges, nation, nation is not this and that. Nation is people. Without having high-quality people, there is no high-quality nation. So, our focus has been little bit off, but I cannot complain on that because for the conditions in which we were, from ninety percent illiteracy, today we've brought it down 
probably to 10, 15 percent, I think most… almost every child in the uh, country, including villages, is going to school, male and female children are going to school, which is all phenomenal, you can always talk about and uh, compare to some other country and comment about it. But I think what India has done is really good. Our only problem has been uh, a very… Uh, we also… as we bred population, we also bred corruption, which has been a cancer eating our nation from within that we have come to a place we can't trust each other anymore. We cannot just talk to each other as men. When I say men, when a man says something to another man, it must be a word of trust. Otherwise, how do you operate every day? I have to espionage on you to find out what you're doing behind my back is a very hard way to live. Unfortunately, we have come to that place where we are pushing the population to that place where nobody can trust anyone. Everybody has to be investigated. If you are straight, you are a big question mark. What is wrong with you? <laughs> if you don't do anything wrong, there must be something seriously wrong with you. Uh, this kind of corruption, not just at the government level, it's just entered everything. It's just entered every aspect of life. Uh, that is easier spoken about because fixing that is not a simple thing. It needs a whole inspiration in the nation. Right now, in many ways, uh, probably in the last seventy-two years, except for the probably, let's say, post-independence, first few years, it was an inspired population. But that inspiration, we did not convert it into effective action. It kind of went to waste. At that time, when people were willing to die for this country, we should have converted that. We did not convert that. Still in this country, most people do not know what is India, okay? They don't even identify with the nation. Still their caste, religion, creed, ethnicity is still very dominant. Simply because the I nation is just an idea, we must understand this. It's an idea that all of us subscribe to and work for. Only if all of us subscribe for it and all of us work for it, it becomes a great idea. Otherwise, it's a disastrous idea. Right now, we are neither here nor there, we are still kind of struggling. Now, I would say probably the idea of a nation, the sense of nationhood is a little stronger now in the last few years than what it was. Right now, people have some pride of being Indian. Indians are being better respected wherever they go in the world. For variety of reasons, one important thing is the economic development. And of course, the infrastructure in the country, you land in India today, Indian airports are better than most US airports. It is actually way better. You land in Delhi, Mumbai, anywhere, these airports are way better than what most US cities have. So because of that, our image has gone up. Now people are looking at India in a different way. This is something that we fail to understand that we have lots of principles and ideologies, but we have no sense. So we are now beginning to operate as a business nation, slowly beginning to move in that direction because we need to understand today a nation's well-being does not happen because of its military prowess or because of its political rhetoric. It happens only because of successful businesses. This understanding, it took a long time to come, it took over fifty years for us to understand. Only since uh, mid-nineties, we sort of understood without businesses being successful, there is no successful nation. But for these twenty-five years, I think we've come a long way. How India was twenty-five years ago, how it is now, it is a phenomenal difference. We still have many things to fix, there's no question about. But today, if you go to any village in the remotest part of Tamil Nadu or in southern India at least, maybe you can uh, exempt a few states like Bihar, some parts of UP, they, it may be a little different. But in southern India, if you come, you go to the remotest village, every girl in the village is going to school, properly dressed up according to her own standards, but properly dressed up, clean, walking with great pride to the school, which is the future. In another fifteen years, all these kids will be something else, you know? So that is happening. It is just that the size of the population also we must control. If we don't control the population, we will be in real problem. But we are not able to make those decisions to… due to political reasons, religious obstructions all along the way. Everybody wants to have more numbers. 
uh, all <laughs> religious leaders from every group telling their people, you produce more children, you produce more children, everybody is competing. If we go on producing more children, as a nation will be a disaster. Because nobody can live well in this country if we continue to increase the population. We… see, the United Nations has made a estimate that by 2050, by 2050 we could be 9.7 billion people, nearly 10 billion people. 10 billion people on this planet, believe me, nobody can live well. Nobody can live well in this world. So, if it becomes 10 billion, India's population would be close to two, you know, like uh, nearly uh, <clears throat> two billion people. Two billion people in this country, nobody in this country can live well. Simply, it's not possible. So, instead of making predictions as if you're astrologers, why is it that the world and the leadership in the world has a plan? We must have a plan, by 2050 we'll be four billion people. If we are 3.5 to 4 billion people on this planet, everybody can live well, there is no issue. So how do we do this? Simply some incentives have to come. Some strong incentives and disin disincentives have to come. Without this, we cannot provide things like that. See, right now in this country, if you want to provide a decent uh, home for 1.4 billion people, just imagine the amount of area that's going to be built up in this country, just unimaginable. Most people, more than fifty percent of the people are living in shacks in this country. You may call it a village, but it's just a shack, all right? It's like a slum. Because of that, you are managing. But if you provide a decent home for all the people, the amount of area that you cover is going to be phenomenal. So it's important that we also strive as we develop the nation, we also understand that how much population, human population, can this land manage is an estimate. The, all these studies are there in the world. This is not some, you know, uh, what to say, this is not some rocket science. This is simple arithmetic that we need to manage. But for this, we must go beyond all kinds of emotions that we have created in the form of religion, philosophies, ideologies. We must keep it aside and learn to handle this nation in a sensible manner, which today I think the leadership is trying to do, but you know, it is such a diverse country. Diverse not just in culture, if we just culturally drivers, diverse, that would make us rich. But here, everybody thinks, for every five people there are eight opinions, and they want to uh, manifest all their eight opinions, the five people. So it's one big chaos, unless there is very strong incentives and disincentives, uh, disincentives, you cannot really uh, fix certain aspects of social behavior because being a democracy, we can't forcefully do things as they do in some other country, but here only with incentives and a uh, certain way of discouraging people, population, how you build your homes, how you live, how much you use, all these things must have incentives. If I am living with a very small footprint, I must have incentives. Then I will see how to be ecologically sensible, how to manage things, how to make sure everything is available for me, all this. Above all, when we talk about healthcare, everybody is thinking America kind of healthcare, that is never going to work for us. They have a three trillion dollar, three point two trillion dollar healthcare bill for three and fifty million people. If you go by those standards, you need a twelve trillion dollar healthcare uh, package for India. When is that going to happen? Our economy itself was uh, 2.7 or 2.8 trillion. Probably it will shrink substantially right now with this lockdown and everything. So that form of healthcare we must give up. This is why the yogic practices and Ayurveda and other simple home remedies we are trying to bring to everybody. Simply daily if you invest thirty minutes upon your life, you will see, most probably you will never see a doctor in a very long time. I… I mean, just to… Uh, you know, just to manifest this, I'm saying, last thirty-nine years I've been active in public life. Almost every day, almost every day, seven days of the week, I have events going. In these thirty-nine years, I have not cancelled a single event because I am not well. And I'm traveling extensively every day, I'm in a new country, in a different place, in a different place. So this is not some… this is not about being superhuman or something. This is about understanding 
that being human itself is super. If we do not explore that nature within us, that every human being has, and we just caught up, get caught up in our own belief systems, our own ideologies and philosophies, then even your education will turn against us. Even the so-called modern education is turning against us because educated people are the people who are destroying this planet, not the illiterate people. Illiterate people are not destroying the world, it is only the educated people. So what kind of education are we giving? This is something seriously we need to be looked at. With this lockdown, we have to rethink education anyway. This whole tyranny of sending every child… every child to the school that he must go and slog there for six to eight hours to learn the same stuff that everybody else is learning, this tyranny must end now. That's… at least the virus should bring this much wisdom to us because this is not the way to conduct. This mass education is Manchester style of industry, that you put everybody into the same slot and get them out in the same shape and form. This has to go, human genius has to be explored. And in many ways, all of you in the industry can play a role in this. Right now, there is no choice that governments and parents have to take this call, how to educate our children for the future, not just wasting fifteen to twenty years in a schoolroom, learning rudimentary stuff. What… what your internet can say, the teacher is struggling to say the same things. So, as informa… in education as information is out, education as innovation, education as inspiration, education as insight is what is meaningful now. Education as information is out because information is available everywhere. Sadhguru, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> I know my kids hate going to school and I'm sure, uh, you know, they will they will benefit from this uh, new new age education that comes. And Sadhguru, just another thing, you have, you have so much depth of knowledge and so much that you can share with us and we have so many questions. Is it okay to take one more question? <laughs> Two sentence answer, please tell me what's the yes. question. <laughs> please. Uh, Namaskaram Guruji. Uh, sir, just a, qu a quick question, more relevant in the current times today uh, work from home. My question is on that particular issue. Has been spoken for some time, now more relevant because of the lockdown and the fear of the virus, etc. But a lot of companies are today saying that this is going to be the order of the day. and and claim, IT companies claim that 75% of the population would be working from home. Coming to the Indian scenario where uh, where, pe where people stay, mainly the metro, small houses, families, I really would like to understand that how would this pan out in our country, considering our producti productivity levels, considering our social environment people need to be socially connected psychological, which today we itself are hearing is a problem. We would appreciate to have your views on that, sir. Sir, the prob… Uh, hello, is it okay? What happened to the microphone? Is it okay? Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, the problem with the country right now is… Uh, <laughs> one problem with a whole lot of people is, whatever they say in America, we like to repeat the same thing without understanding what our realities are. Sir, so tomorrow I think uh, 24th, uh, the airlines are starting. Suppose you got into Air India and the pilot called and said, I'm working from home. How do you fly, sir? <laughs> so you are a builder. <laughs> you can't build from home, you <laughs> have to go there and do many things. There's certain type of work which can be done from home, of course. So uh, instead of that, if our offices and homes are located either close by or in the same building, it will solve a whole lot of problems. Working from home is relevant only for certain type of work and those who are just… most of their work is on computer, they don't have to interact with people. Instead of wasting time, you know, commuting up and down, definitely it's sensible to work from home. But there are many, many other challenges and more than eighty-five percent of the workforce in the country cannot work from home maybe ten to twelve percent at the most can work from home. Thank you very much.
Thank you very, very much. I just wish to tell all our viewers that I checked with your ashram you. and you have some very simple and effective tools to help us go through these troubled times and of course build ourselves up as people for the future. And these are being offered right now um, in terms of uh, Inner Engineering Online, which is your flagship course, Sadhguru. And I would like to just spell out for everybody's benefit, please take down this detail www.ishafoundation.org. I'll repeat www.ishafoundation.org is where you can go and get these free tools that will allow you, like I asked him, mental and spiritual well being is the most important, Sadhguru. Once again, thank you from my entire fraternity. Thank you from Creda and CHI as well as Naredco. I, I thank you for coming. And this one hour 20 minutes or one hour 30 minutes was too less for all the depth of knowledge that you have, the fountain of knowledge that you have. Thank, thank you. Thank you and... Uh... ...defines how our nation looks and lives. So may you be successful in what you're doing, but as I said, all of you should move from personal ambitions to a larger vision of building this nation. Let's make it happen. Guru, until then, thank you. Thank you.